All right. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, my name is Bo. I'm here with Ace Lab. We're helping out with pre presenting today's event. Um, it's presented by TRA Snow and Sun. So we've got Mindy from their team here today, who's going to be providing today's AIA approved course. Um, and I am going to send over a link in the chat momentarily. Um, we did ask for AIA numbers upon registration. In case you're worried you forgot to add it there, I'll send over a link for a form so that you can submit that number to us and your credits will be reported directly to the AIA. Um, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Helen. She's our Director of Architectural Experience. She's going to go ahead and give a quick little intro about Ace Lab, show you guys how you can get in touch with today's presenters after the event if you have any follow-up questions or want some more information from them. Um, and then we'll go ahead and get started with today's CEU approved course. All right, Helen, feel free to take it away. Mindy, if you wouldn't mind stopping your screen share for a moment so Helen can do a quick little tour, that would be great. Cool. So as my screen share is loading, let me know. Okay. Does that look good? Can you see it? Awesome. Yep. Perfect. Hi, everyone. I'm Helen. Um, it's nice to meet y'all today. Thanks for joining. So I'm going to talk about something really quickly. Um, we had somebody reach out to us via the live chat that we launched fairly recently on the site, um, and they were looking for aluminum windows with a specific solar heat gain coefficient to meet their needs on a project um, in terms of their energy modeling. So our AVE team was able to come together, put together some recommendations, leave some comments as well. Some of these manufacturers, as you all know, sometimes you have the glazing included, sometimes you'll be selecting the glazing. So being able to share that information with this individual is really helpful. Then you also, if you've used ACE Lab in this capacity, you're able to see all these side-by-side -side comparisons here of the sizes, different add-ons you can do, um, finishes, and I'll keep scrolling on down to performance data, which I think is really, really fun to be able to see all in one window. I think for a lot of folks, this exists on a lot of Google Sheets. Um, and then certifications, and then again, those glazing packages we discussed earlier. So this is one way that y'all can use this live chat is to reach out to us and get some extra help. Um, and if you want to book a session to talk more about this, feel free to do so. We can kind of talk about different ways to use Ace Lab, um, increase collaboration, find the right products for your, your team, your, your project. Um, and one other thing that I want to share with you today is if you want to get in touch with Mindy or any manufacturer, y'all can come up to this top bar. We're going to type in TRA. We're going to go into brands and here I can find their page. Oops, there we go. Click on that. And um, what this is going to do is allow y'all to see connect with uh, Mindy directly, as well as see the location of where they are and then all the products that they have. Um, with that, I will let Mindy take it away and thank y'all for joining. I used to live in a very snowy area. This is important stuff. So enjoy your webinar today. All right, take care. Awesome, thanks so much, Ellen. All right, Mindy, whenever you feel ready, feel free to go ahead and get started. I think you are on mute, there you go. I am unmuted, there we go. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Mindy Dahlquist. I am the Business Development Manager at TRA Snow and & Sun. And today's course is going to be focused solely on uh, rooftop snow retention. And we will kind of jump into many different factors that play into snow retention and some of the things um, that are going to be quite important while designing in snowy areas. So this course is AIA certified. Um, all of the information and material that is contained in this course was researched, assembled, and produced by TRA Snow and Sun. So if there's any questions or concerns, issues you have about the material, please don't hesitate to let me know to contact me directly. I'm more than happy to look in to any questions or concerns that you may have. So this course is going to provide a review of the problems, safety issues, and solutions that are associated with snow and ice moving on roofs. So particularly, we're going to focus on the heavy snow accumulation areas. We're always going to look at worst case scenario on this. We also will take a look into the in-depth training of the proper engineering and installation of snow retention systems as well. Currently at this time, we're just trying to help bridge the gap that's created by the lack of codes and standards relating to rooftop snow retention. So in certain areas, there are starting to be a attempt of codes and standards for snow retention, but at this time there is nothing for them to actually look to or be able to have any kind of standard to lean on. 
So all of the objections within this course is just realizing that codes and standards, as I mentioned, are just non-existent at this point. We'll also take a look at the common hazards and damages that are caused when heavy snow does move on the roof. And there are some everyday solutions, some do-it-yourself kind of practices. We will take a look, compare and contrast, see what works, what doesn't, um, what could be recommended, and what you should definitely be avoiding. We also will look into modern snow retention systems, kind of identify some of those and help you understand the different snow retention options that are out there. And then there's also a lot of factors that need to be considered while engineering snow retention devices and the layouts for those. We also have some insider information on how to eliminate ice dams. It really doesn't focus solely around snow retention, um, but we do go in depth in that just because we have the information um, due to the owner of our company and some of the consultant work that he has done in the past. So always just here to share some of that information and move forward as we need to. I have a few videos. Um, my first video that I would like to share with you, there is not going to be any sound that comes across for you, um, but it will still get the point across on how heavy the snow is and how fast that snow does move once it is moving on the roof. So with that, you can see that we are talking about heavy snow. So this is going to be on the higher end of that. Um, this is actually in the Lake Tahoe area in California. So they do receive very, very large amounts of snow. Um, oftentimes designers who are designing in this area are not always from or familiar with the area. So it is very, very important to take very large precaution while designing in some of these different snow areas areas and ski resort areas because the amount of snow that they receive, um, I believe Tahoe's snow loads can go anywhere from 400 to, I think the highest one I've seen is 469 pounds per square foot in that area. So that is definitely a lot of consideration that needs to be taken while building in those um, specific regions. So we're not looking at a light little skiff of snow, although when you're in like the Midwest and some of those areas, the heaviest part of the snow isn't the concern like you are in the Tahoe region. You are actually going to have larger concerns with ice um, and that ice sliding off of the roof than you will actually the sheer amount of snow on the roof. So when the heavy snow accumulates, it glaciates across the entirety of that roof. So that mass becomes... It goes from little tiny snowflakes to one giant mass on your roof. So when it slides off, it can take anything in the way with it, just like it has with this dormer here. We're, you're looking at heavy and hard snow. It does not stay light and fluffy. Since there are no codes or standards currently that exist for the engineering, manufacturing, or installation of snow retention systems in both the U.S. or Canada, and there's just no building codes to follow, to this does result in at least the following that we are aware of. At this point, snow retention companies are able to manufacture their systems however they want and out of whatever materials they want. So I always say you could take a coffee cup if you wanted and super glue it all across your entire roof and say, oh, I have a snow retention system. And there is no one out there that can argue that that is not a snow retention system because there is no standard on how those should be manufactured or what materials they should be made out of, how they should be fastened, any of that. Municipalities also have a difficult time codifying snow retention since there is no standard to reference. So in Lake Tahoe areas or in some of these very heavy snow load areas where they have issues with snow, 
with without having anything to say what a snow retention system is, how are they able to tell you that you need to have a snow retention system on your home? Some people may take that as seven brackets across a door above a doorway or a one bar system above the eave when technically they would need four bars to hold the snow up. There's just no information that's saying, oh, if you're in this amount of snow load area with this kind of slope, you need X amount of brackets or X amount of fences. So without having that, municipalities kind of just take a step back and let the homeowners and building owners handle it as they would like. And then the owners just don't really want to pay for it because it's, even if it's needed, it's just not required by that code. There's nothing enforcing it. And oftentimes it's it'll just fall on the trees, it'll be okay. So architects also then have a difficult time knowing exactly how to specify the snow retention as well. So with knowing all of those things, the most common hazards and challenges that we're seeing when snow does move on the roof, the most serious one is going to be personal injury and death. Um, anything from there is obviously very minuscule and for us as um, the outside looking in, but as a homeowner, these things become much more intense when you're looking at damage from sliding snow and ice, premature aging. I, I had an architect ask me one time if the aging happened to the homeowner or to the roofing material. And this was actually meant for the roofing material, but if you've ever had to replace your roof, you know that it probably could cause a few gray hairs. So then you also have limited and restricted access and views if that snow does start to slide off or does slide off completely and then ground snow removal so oftentimes once that snow slides you do have to take care of it at that point so first we'll dive into personal injury and death so i had um i have some videos here they are all three different deaths in three different states um, over the years and I was just actually talking before we started this webinar this morning about how uh, about this time last year in 2023, there were two deaths within one week of each other in two different states. So I am located in Utah. There was one not too far from us here in Utah. It was a 50 year old man where the rooftop avalanche um, did unfortunately kill him and then a five year old girl in Durango, Colorado and the same thing. So it is definitely something that happens, but something that's interesting in the three videos that I have that are not from last year, they all call it a freak accident. So if it's something that's happening year after year and sometimes even within a week of each other, is it truly a freak accident at that point? It sounds a little too common to me to be a freak accident, and we believe that it's something that is completely preventable. So since I cannot share the sound on these, I'm just going to bypass these um, completely and we'll get a little less on the serious side of things and move on to damage to the roofing material. So as you can see, this dormer has experienced some damage to that metal roofing material just from the force of that snow that has slid down it. Other factors into the design, such as this double valley that we're seeing here, can also funnel that force and that weight of the snow into the side of the roofing material, and it's caused these metal shingles to crumble just like tinfoil at that point. Penetrations also become a very easy target for sliding snow. So PVC pipe that's utilized for plumbing, this actually oftentimes is sheared right off. I'm not sure that the one in the lower picture was installed fully properly, um, but the if I zoomed out on that photo, I actually, the, all of the penetrations on this roof have been pulled out. So the metal conduit that's used for electrical wiring penetrations also oftentimes gives way to sliding snow and ice. Chimneys, gutters, there are so many different things that have been torn off and continue to be torn off the roof due to the sliding snow on the roof. The worst thing that happens with this is oftentimes it is not noticed right away and you now have a open hole in your roof that you are not aware of until there is something continuing to occur. Um, sometimes people do go out and take a look at things once that snow has slid, but it's not as common as you would hope. Snow shedding from the upper roof to a lower roof is probably the number one cause of damage that we see on dormers and doorways, those types of things. That weight coming from any 
any height whatsoever. You're just getting such an impact and force going onto that roofing material. This photo is a little hard to see, but as you get down towards the eave, you are not supposed to have that little zigzag pattern that is happening there. And there's quite a big amount of a little crater up at the top here. So those types of things can be prevented by retaining the snow on the upper roof that sheds to a lower roof and helping to protect those environments as well. When snow does freeze to the roof and then move, it can take any of that roofing material with it. It's just like an ice cube tray. If you put anything, you could glue it in the bottom of your ice cube tray if you really wanted to. And in most cases, if you fill it with water and freeze it, try to pop it out of there. Whatever you've glued to the bottom, depending on what type of glue you use, I guess. But in most cases, it is going to freeze with it and pop right out of that ice cube tray. Our roofs are not that much different and it is going to oftentimes take some of that product with it, whether it's the granules on your shingles or any of your other materials that are able to be pulled up. So this photo here is kind of just a little fun one. It just shows you how fast that snow has to be moving to be able to come off of the roof because it has not bent this metal panel even remotely. I believe they may have forgotten some clips on this metal panel, but the amount of times that things like this happen on a project are it just reoccurs very often. So it is things that need to be considered and need to be looked at. So this one just basically shows that snow came off of this roof and did not even bend that panel. So it had to have come off quite quickly. Other parts of the structure besides the roof can also be damaged. So Oftentimes, landscape is forgotten about. Um, homeowners and building owners will spend thousands of dollars on landscaping surrounding their house and then only to allow that snow to slide off and crush all of that landscaping. Things like deck enclosures that we're seeing in this photo here is also something that is not always taken into consideration. So the neighbor does have snow retention on their cabin. Their cabins are quite identical, but the home that has snow retention still also has their deck enclosure as well. At least the people that have lost their deck enclosure will now be able to just shovel that snow right off the side, but it will need to be repaired or somehow have some type of situation to be able to make that safe. And now you have a whole lot of mess to clean up and they will most likely probably get some snow retention on that roof and have the same type of situation that their neighbor has currently with that deck mount system that we're seeing. So gas meters are now taken into consideration um, when you're looking at codes and standards for snow shed areas, but it is something when you're looking at um, remodels, that type of thing, definitely take into consideration the gas meter location, where the snow will shed, and just making sure that you're protecting that home and the people inside it from those types of situations. In Sun Peaks, Canada, there was a situation where the Snow did shut off the roof into the gas meter. Everything looked to be okay. Um, the homeowners went out, shoveled everything off. Everything looked to be perfectly sound. And three days later, luckily everyone was at home and at school. So there was no one home at that time, but their home actually did explode. So that is definitely something that can happen. Another dangerous thing to take a look at here is just the snow that's hanging off of the eave of that roof. So right off the edge there, that can just be dangerous. There's footsteps going up and down. All it takes is your child running out the door, slamming the door behind them to run out to a friend's house, and the snow can slide off of that roof at any given point. So this is kind of a different situation. So this is something that you see actually quite often. I don't know that there's a scientific word for it. Um, it's something that we call creep and curl, where you don't have a steep enough slope for that snow to actually shoot off of there quickly. And so the snow sliding off of the roof actually can curl under the eave and break some windows. So what is happening here is the ridge or the uppermost part of your roof is going to be where you have the majority of your heat 
heat loss. As you get down towards that eave or the edge of the roof, it's going to be much colder. You have airflow that's happening underneath that eave. And so the temperature changes from the top of the roof to the bottom of the roof are going to be very drastic. So as you have that melt off that starts to happen up at the top most part of your roof, it's going to then slide down to the lower parts. And as it gets down there, it refreezes. So you have a change in consistency of that snow, and then it's actually being pulled down by gravity. It continues to curl underneath. And oftentimes these are not homes that are lived in regularly. And so when you have summer homes, things like that, there's no one staying in these cabins during the winter. This is also a ski in ski out area. And so if the snow does decide to let loose off of there and doesn't break through the windows, giving those homeowners that that lovely surprise, then there's not much of an escape route. If you're skiing through this area, you have a concrete retaining wall or a pile of snow. So those types of considerations definitely need to be taken. Um, oftentimes we are utilizing the majority of the lot when it comes to these mountain homes and we're wanting to make sure that we are getting as much of home as we can on the lot but if you are allowing that snow to slide off you definitely need to consider where and how much snow is going to be moving any property adjacent to the structure can also be damaged from sliding snow falling off of a roof. These are two different incidents, but another one that's very important is going to be your garage doors. I have seen houses that shed snow on right in front of the garage door. I've seen garages that shed snow right in front of a home door. That is going to be very, very important as well. Um, I actually personally know someone who built their house to where the snow sheds right in front of their garage. And they also keep their little tractor that they plow the snow with inside that garage. So when you can't open the garage door, that kind of causes some problems. So the photo on the left that we're seeing here, this is a Chevy Equinox. This is in New York City. A multi-story building actually did shed snow off of the roof. And it was very unexpected. The gentleman was about 100 feet away from his vehicle when that snow fell down. And I'm sure he is quite happy that he was not yet inside. And that's just going to be quite a mess for him to get cleaned up. The photo on the right, this is quite dated, as you can see, but I think it's very important to continue to look at this because PVC pipe has never been designed to be a snow retention system, and the amount of times that I've seen this happen is pretty crazy. So this is a hotel that was under construction or a a motel, I believe, that was under construction. And so these are construction workers' vehicles. Nothing quite like getting off of work after working for 12, 12 hours that day and having to replace your windshield, dig the snow out of your car, and probably have to put that PVC pipe back up on the roof, even though it shouldn't be there in the first place. So all of these different situations that if there was just a little bit more care taken into consideration just would not have happened. This photo just shows how much that snow wants to stay together. Once it's there, it's collected on the roof. This light pool has never been intended to be a snow retention device, and yet here it is doing quite a good job at this point. As long as that snow pile doesn't shift or the light pole doesn't give way, it most likely will stay right there in place um, or if they don't get any more snow. But your other areas should not be utilized as snow retention and this should not be happening. So that snow stays in one mass and oftentimes we think that it just falls off in chunks and it does not. I mentioned earlier about the asphalt shingle granules. This can happen on all different types of roofing material, but this is just a good example of how you have an area that's subjected to repeated expansion and contraction, lots of freeze-thaw cycles happening on that roof. And then if you add the force of the accumulated snow, it decides to slide. Next thing you know, you're tearing off parts of that roofing material. Premature roof aging also happens on metal roofs. So 
basically, if you think about the snow that's been sitting outside for a couple days, if you pick up a snowball and rub it against your skin, it is going to be extremely rough, icy. It is not going to just feel good on your skin. Well, it's doing the same thing on the roof. As things shift and move even slightly, it is compacted, crusty snow. It's acting just like sandpaper. It can definitely wear off these protective coatings. This is a very local picture to us. Uh, we're not, I'm in Utah, but my area itself is not a very high, heavy snow load area. I believe we're 50 pounds per square foot. So this is a very local and low snow load area to show you what kind of damage can happen even in those lower snow load areas. So limited and restricted access. Once that snow does decide to move, it can then block access to the home or to the building as well. It can also take dormers with it and it can be quite a mess to clean up. Um, this is going to be very, very difficult. You are not going to go at this with snow shovels. This is going to be pickaxes and whatever you might have to be able to get through that. When designing with snow shed in mind, if you are designing to make sure that that snow does come off of the roof, making sure that everything within the actual outside of the home is going to reflect that is going to be very important. So this cabin was built with snow shed in mind. They wanted to get the snow off of the roof as fast as possible. The only problem with that is the driveway and the front entrance are separated by that pile of snow. So there is a gorgeous walkway that leads you to the front entrance from that driveway. And unfortunately, they don't have any good access to their home, so they find themselves using a back door along the other side of the home. So making sure that those considerations are taken if you are shedding snow is going to be very important. This homeowner, I this slide always reminds me completely of my husband. He loves to build things himself. This homeowner knew that they had a problem with sliding snow and ice, as you can tell from all of the crickets that are installed behind the chimney and all the penetrations on the roof. They continued to have issues with broken windows, and so they decided that they would do a do-it-yourself type of situation and install plywood on sliding tracks, basically like a barn style window covering that they would be able to slide over their windows when they have a snowstorm to protect the snow and ice from breaking their windows. Unfortunately, two windows were still broken and now you have this giant pile of snow. You also live in the mountains. You want to be able to see your beautiful view to the outside and unfortunately now it looks like you live in a cave. So as I mentioned, reminds me of my husband because sometimes it's the more difficult way to go, but it's always a do-it-yourself type of situation on how can we fix this faster. So removing the ground snow, oftentimes that does need to be removed. It can be extremely costly, time consuming and labor intensive. So I personally have done heavy snow removal in Utah. Uh, my first storm, I hopped out of a truck into 26 inches of snow. That was quite a surprise coming from the Midwest myself. But I want you to understand that for a piece of equipment to remove snow, it is upwards of $350 per hour and is extremely time consuming. So if you're talking snow that's been sitting on the roof all winter long and slides off in March, that snow is going to be a pain to get through and it is going to take a lot of time. And then where does it go once they pick it up? They either have to haul it out of there unless you have a location to take it to. So all of those things do need to be considered when you're letting that snow slide off the roof. There are many do-it-yourself or everyday solutions that do happen when it comes to snow sliding off of the roof. If you travel or live in a mountain region where you're seeing these types of situations, I'm sure you've seen a sign somewhere that says, ice falls from the roof, be proceed with caution or watch your head or any of those types of things. There's also the caution tape approach. So just caution taping off of an area and then manual rooftop snow removal. 
So some do choose to simply put up a sign every single year or leave one up year after year. Unfortunately, when you're talking about lawsuits and those types of situations, it does not remove any type of liability from the owners of the property. Instead, it basically says, I knew that I had an issue and I chose to put a sign up. And in cases like this, when you choose to put a sign up that is the same color as the siding that most likely will be covered in snow when it is snowing, it oftentimes does not protect you in any way, shape, or form. And then sometimes these signs are put in very interesting places. So we have handicapped parking spots so that you're able to take your lovely grandma out to lunch and get her in her wheelchair and get her into the the little cafe there, but the problem is the roof sheds snow and ice directly onto those locations. So can be very, very hazardous in those situations as well. The caution tape approach, this is something that is very, very common. We'll just caution tape or orange cone off these areas. And unfortunately, as you can see in this photo, that doesn't always work out. The snow can fall onto that caution tape. The caution tape can be removed. The wind can tear it, all different types of things. Someone can be using it as a jump rope. You never quite know. And this approach also just limits access to otherwise usable areas of the property. So. There's actually a really good example of this in Canada, the Winter Olympic area that was built specifically for winter. So there's a gathering area there for you to be able to ski in, ski out, sit down, drink some hot chocolate with your friends, whatever. There's heated areas, there's tables, all of it is beautiful, except the only problem is it is a winter gathering area that is not usable during the winter due to the fact that the snow sheds from the surrounding buildings directly onto those heaters and tables, and it becomes a gathering area for the winter that is not usable in the winter. So considerations there are quite important. Now there is manual snow and ice removal. If you have any form of social media, you have seen probably several of these videos showing the types of fails that can happen while removing snow off of your roof. Now these are just lighthearted and funny, but this is a serious conversation. So OSHA puts out a statement every single winter as winter starts that the snow and ice removal off of the rooftop is extremely dangerous, that someone dies from it every single year, and oftentimes multiple people do. So Choosing to shovel the roof off every year, this does risk damage to your roof surface, endangers anyone who is shoveling or walking below, and also is extremely labor expensive. So this is a dangerous job for the guys getting up on that roof. A roof can be a dangerous location even without these conditions. But something also to take into consideration is these men here in this photo are standing on a copper roof. So this, I believe this photo is actually in Park City if I remember correctly. So this is a brand new copper roof earlier this season, and these men are up there with metal shovels. I'm sure for their own safety, they have spikes on their boots. And to get through some of that layer of ice, I'm sure they probably are using pickaxes or they're utilizing their metal shovels in a way of a pickaxe. So with that, you are risking a lot of damage to a brand new, extremely expensive roofing material. And oftentimes that damage is not going to be noticed or reported directly. So if these guys are up there and their spike goes through the roof, they probably wouldn't even know it. They would probably think they stepped on some ice and they stand back up, finish cleaning the rest of the roof off. You go on about your life. And then next thing you know, in spring or when this the rest of the snow starts melting, you have some rain happening, those types of situations, then you notice that you're having leaks and other problems. So these can definitely follow up with extreme repairs down the road. This video here is in another country. So this man from what I believe is perfectly okay, but this just shows how fast this becomes a dangerous situation. Luckily for him, he works with some very helpful people who must be highly trained in making sure that someone's spine is not broken. They pick him up, pat him on the back, and send him on his way, probably back up to the roof to finish the job he started. 
So I do, I apologize for my sarcasm. It comes naturally. I don't know how to help that. But it just shows you how fast this can turn into a serious situation. And that man is very, very lucky that something worse did not come out of this. The photo in the middle just shows exactly how much snow can be up there compared to the person. I'm not sure what his end game will be when gravity takes effect on that pile of snow that he's trying to separate there. And the photo on the right just shows how much manpower and how much effort has to go into removing the snow once it has accumulated on the roof. So let's take a look at a few design practices in the US and Canada as potential solutions. So I'll run through this pretty quickly, but as a general rule in the US and Canada, structures are typically designed with steep sloping roofs in mountainous regions and low slopes in the lowlands. So we want to just let that snow slide right off. Except our solution is kind of designed around the snow itself and doesn't effectively address the many disadvantages and dangers that we've just discussed. So Europe's design strategy is actually exact opposite of what we do in the U.S. and Canada. They choose to use a low slope roof in mountainous regions to prevent damage to the roof, as well as retain the snow on the roof as an insulating blanket. With that, they are actually promoting energy efficiency. And while retaining the snow on the roof, you're allowing for that even snow melt off, lack of injuries to residents or guests. You're not having anything come slamming down on the property below it. You're helping to save some money, limit liability issues, and it does allow for a little more architectural freedom. And then in the lowland areas, they actually use very steep slopes and just are facilitating a large amount of water egress there. So I mentioned less design freedom for a disadvantage to shedding snow, but then you also are losing that snow as an insulator as well. Oftentimes then dormers are brought up. So whether intentional or not, dormers do work very well to hold snow in place or divert it once it is moving. They do minimize the possible locations for snow to fall and work pretty well to shield certain locations such as walkways and entranceways to protect those areas below. But they do come with their own disadvantages. Although dormers themselves can be very effective at diverting the snow once it is moving or shielding those areas below, oftentimes that roofing product, no matter the type of roofing product, is not strong or durable enough to handle the weight and the forces of the moving snow. So this dormer here has done a great job of diverting the snow and protecting that walkway, but unfortunately received quite a large amount of damage from that sliding snow and ice. They also create a lot of areas on that roof that are going to alternate regularly between sun and shade. So you're increasing that cycle of the freeze thaw that's happening and this is just adding more potential for ice buildup. So you just have those areas as I mentioned earlier with those heat differences at the top of the roof moving down towards the eave that is increasing it on many many points of that dormer and this can often create other issues damage down the road that does require maintenance. So what about different roofing products? There are slippery roofs, non-slippery roofs. What can be used as effective solutions? When it comes to snow, some type of roofs are very, very slippery and snow retention is going to be a great answer on them. Um, but it is something that it's that snow is going to move one way or another. Those options are going to be metal roofs, composite and synthetic roofs, eco roofs, and single ply roofs. None of these roofing materials by themselves will be effective at stopping snow from moving at all. A good example of this, and I'll play this video, it doesn't have any sound anyways, but this is the Dallas Texas Stadium. So Texas does not get very much snow and most everything shuts down when it does. So they have a giant grater out there taking care of their little skiff of snow. This snow slides off of this stadium roof and it hits six people. Those six people filed a lawsuit and won. So in an area where snow is not a major concern, there was obviously no consideration for snow and it cost them a large, large chunk of money. So in areas where snow should be considered, cons considerate, oh my goodness, I can't get that word out, okay. 
in areas where snow should be considered, then it is definitely something that in that lawsuit, it is not going to be a fighting chance to be able to say, listen, you should have seen the snow coming off of the roof. They will always be looking to, well, what precautions did you take to make sure the snow did not slide off of the roof? An interesting story that came from this Dallas stadium is the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia, is actually managed by the same management company. And so due to this lawsuit, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium has a gigantic custom four bar snow retention fence of around the entire stadium so that stadium opens and closes and is very complex on its own and they decided to add a massive snow retention system to the whole stadium to just help eliminate some of that risk of another lawsuit like they saw in dallas so other roofing products are not very slippery slow snow just doesn't move as easily on them and so roofing products in that category would be included in tile and slate, wood shingles and shakes, asphalt shingles, and rock-coated metal shingles. So oftentimes, because there's a little bit more friction there, it's very much thought that snow just doesn't move on those types of materials. We don't need snow retention on tile and slate or asphalt shingles. It is something that comes up quite often. But unfortunately, that's just not true. So I'll get into TRA's story a little bit more in the future, but TRA actually stands for Tile Roof Accessories. So tile roofs are actually where we got into business. So the snow that accumulated on this tile roof has moved and it just absolutely damaged all different parts of this roofing material completely. So it looks like a jackhammer just went through on here. And as going back to the European concept, um, in Europe, there's a lot of concrete tile that is utilized all over the roofs. They also get pretty heavy snow. And so snow retention is one of the ways that they actually mitigate issues with their tile and slate roofs to help protect them. Wood roofs just are not as slippery as tile and slate, but snow definitely still does move on those. It, of course, takes the right situation, but it definitely still can happen. The photo on the right shows a deck railing that is now removed from the sliding snow and ice. Asphalt shingles are the ones that roofers will never believe me that snow moves on an asphalt shingle until they send me photos like this a year after the project is done. So this home here specifically has replaced this deck railing for separate occasions now and still um, has not found the right solution that they are willing to do. Um, I believe they last I heard their plan was to continue to build this deck out a little further and stop utilizing the door that we're seeing right there in front of that missing railing. They were going to block that off completely, turn the window to the right into a door and extend that deck out and hope that the deck would actually take some of that um, that fall from the snow and some of that weight and just be able to hold it. So not sure how this project is going at this time, um, but as, a, as far as I know, they have not yet installed snow retention. But the snow definitely still moves on these roofs. It's just going to move at a different time. So usually about this time of year and into March, when we start to get some of that melting that's occurring, the nights are still very cold. During the day, we get much warmer temperatures. And that water is actually, the water that's melting during the day is then refreezing at night. It creates a layer of ice and just gives it the perfect environment for that snow to slide. So basically, all roofing types in snowy areas do have problems associated with snow and ice moving on the roof. Modern snow retention systems, let's just dive right into this. So this outhouse does not have snow retention on it, but as I've mentioned, that snow will stay on the roof whether you want it there or not until it decides that it has the perfect environment to move. Snow retention is not a new idea. So this is an example of rocks and boulders that were placed on two roofs um, back in the day. This has been going on for centuries. This is an a replica of an outbuilding, um, like a storage facility outside of a castle. 
And so this is something that has been going on for years and years. Oftentimes they utilized logs or boulders in place of some actual fastened device. Not sure I want to be hit in the head with a log any more than I do a pile of snow, but it was the concept of how do we keep this from moving from the roof. The most common types of modern day snow retention devices are going to be snow brackets or snow fences. Snow brackets are often called snow guards, snow cleats, snow clips. There's a million snow stops. There's a million different terms for it. We will call them snow brackets. They lie directly on the roof surface. Generally, they cover the entirety of the roof and then they mount to the sheathing, the battens or the roofing product itself. Where snow fences We'll go into a little bit of the characteristics, but they're a lot different. So snow fences generally clamp onto a metal roof seam for standing seam panels, or they mount directly to the deck. Where they mount directly to the deck, they need to attach to rafters, trusses, purlins, or other structure. Brackets themselves are designed to penetrate about three inches deep into the blanket of snow on the roof. The snow then freezes to those brackets, resulting in one large glacial snow and ice mass that's held in place, just frozen there. So the most important characteristic of brackets is that they are designed to stop snow from moving, not to stop moving snow. It's a very important when putting brackets on a roof that you are not installing one row of brackets along the eave and hoping that it just cuts the snow up as the snow slides off the roof. That is not how they are designed to work. They are meant to actually hold that snow in place and allow it to be frozen in place evenly across the roof. This image just shows that there's a little bit of a space between the blanket of snow and the roof surface. This does allow for the melted snow to be able to drain. It helps alleviate some of the issues with ice damming because then you have a gap that's allowing that water to actually get out of the roof, um, get off of the roof, where other, otherwise it's caught up underneath that snow mass and then continues to be an issue as it freezes and thaws over and over again. Snow brackets are designed for most roofing products, and these are just some examples of them on various types of roofs. Now, snow fences are utilized a little bit differently. They actually are utilized to stop that af that avalanche that can happen on the roof, but the snow actually slides down to that fence portion and then freezes in place to that fence. So in heavy snow load areas and the European design for snow retention was to utilize snow brackets with fences. So it becomes a very effective system and it helps to mitigate any of those issues of that sliding snow and ice and then also gives you the extra retention there at the eave to protect from any kind of rooftop avalanche as well. If one fence isn't enough, which oftentimes in heavy snow load areas it's not going to be, then this multiple rows can be utilized. So some other companies out there will sell you whatever amount of snow retention you want and allow them to just put it up. However, it is very, very recommended um, that you have this engineered and that you have some kind of background information. The photo on the lower right is showing you eight feet of snow on a two bar system. So in that system specifically, there were two bars necessary, four rows going up, and that is holding that snow in place. This project is a great reference point. They get a massive amount of snow. I believe it's been like 10 years now and it is still in place and doing very, very well. I mentioned deck mount fences must go into structure. This just shows a drawing of that where the clamp on fences clamp directly to the roof seams and hold the snow in place without puncturing through. Snow brackets and fences can be used for almost all types of roofs, various types of materials, including steel, copper, and aluminum, and they can be powder coated to match most roof colors. So the factors that need to be involved when engineering a snow retention system. So the first question asked is how much additional weight will be held on the roof as it's retained? And this we're going to utilize the ground snow load. Basically, we're just saying this is worst case scenario for the past 50 years and we are going to be holding the snow on the roof. Are the buildings then strong enough to support the weight of the snow? So ground snow loads have been part of building code since the mid 1970s. If you are utilizing anything 
on a building built prior to the mid-1970s, please do not install a snow retention system without having a structural engineer take a look at it prior to doing so. So the questions that need to be asked for being able to engineer this system are going to be, what is the roofing product and how is it secured? How strong are the fasteners and how thick is the sheathing? What is the force of the snow on the retention devices? What is the weight of that entire snow mass from eave to ridge? What type of roof slope are we looking at? And how strong is the individual snow retention device? So where does this information come from? Some of this can be looked up or known. So I was in Durango, Colorado just two months back and spoke to a construction manager who let me know that they allow their roofers to engineer their snow retention systems which is quite scary because a roofer can know what the ground snow load is, the slope of the roof, roofing material, sheathing, and rafter or truss spacing. So this is information that can either be looked up on the project or by looking at the plans. But unfortunately, since there are no codes or standards for snow retention systems, there are some things that they just can't know, they can't Google, and it can only be determined by testing. So those types of information are going to be the strength of that individual snow retention device, which will vary depending on what device you're utilizing. What is the pullout strength of the fasteners? There again, will depend on what type of fastener you're utilizing and what type of materials it's going into. And then what is the fail point of the system? So if things go wrong on the system, what is coming off of here? Is this whole retention system coming off? Are the fasteners being pulled out? Is the sheathing being ripped out? If a snow retention company is not testing their products and systems in order to have that data needed, there's no engineering behind that. So this just shows a quick run-up test of a snow bracket. And for the means of time, I'm gonna ruin this for you. And it just pulls the fasteners out over 1,500 pounds. So, it just gives you an idea of what a basic test should look like. So utilizing the engineering and understanding that each factor matters is going to be very, very important. You can have two projects and look Let's say you sent me a project last week for a cabin and you're building a cabin side by side. They look identical. They're the same area code. Everything should be the same, except the owner on the project on the right has decided to utilize a different type or the contractor has decided to utilize a different type of sheathing. So if you are utilizing 7 16th wafer board on this specific project, you are needing 23 brackets per roofing square. If you're utilizing 3 quarter inch CDX plus would on the same type of project, then you would be needing 11 brackets per roofing square. So if you're utilizing an old layout or just assuming that you need the same amount, you could be overselling the project by double what they need per roofing square, or you're underselling it by half, and then you could definitely see failures. So snow brackets are spaced very evenly throughout the roof from eave to ridge in a staggered pattern. The dimensions for that change per the project. These are just examples of what those layouts could look like. Poor engineering is going to be the largest cause for any type of failure on any manufacturer's snow retention system. So if you're not considering ground snow load, slope of the roof, roofing type, material type and thickness, how that roofing product is secured, and fastener pullout, proper installation, then you most definitely can see failures. Plastic brackets are something I will never recommend, even if we started making them ourselves. I could not um, willingly recommend a plastic bracket. I take my kids to a pediatrician down the road, and they have a great landscape design of plastic brackets from their roof all over their landscape. So it is not something that I can recommend for multiple reasons. But retention devices themselves can be very strong, but if you're not utilizing proper engineering and installation, they can fail on all different types of roofs. This was a do-it-yourself situation. They decided they would make their own quarter-inch plate steel snow brackets and install them along the eave of the roof. As I mentioned, the most important characteristic of snow brackets as that they are made to 
sorry about that, that they are made to stop snow from moving, not to stop the moving snow. So this is very, very crucial that they are not just installed along the eave and has caused quite a large amount of damage. So PVC pipe once again and utilizing the correct fasteners. The photo on the right should be installed utilizing lag bolts and was not. Partial installation of snow retention is the largest failure that you will see on snow retention systems. You have this entire glaciated mass that is now being held by that last rib of that snow uh, fence and unfortunately it can get quite messy. So I have definitely talked a whole lot and I know that I'm running short on time. So I'm going to move very, very quickly. Common mistake um, is just not understanding the weight of that upper roof can shed to the lower roof and cause damage. This here is only a foot and a half difference from that upper roof to the lower roof and has caused quite a bit of damage. I mentioned that we would just take a brief look into eliminating ice dams. I'm sh these first few slides just talk about what ice dams are. Um, they are caused mostly by that exact thing that creates the creep and curl where you have those differencing of temperatures. And Europe has kind of a different design solution for how to help eliminate ice dams. Some of that is by utilizing a low slope roof in mountainous regions. It's easier to hold the snow on the roof. Then they are equalizing the roof's temperature to the outside ambient temperature with a ventilated roof system. So with that, they're using a large volume of equal air from eave to ridge. And then they incorporate more insulation with a greater R value and hold the snow on the roof with a snow retention system. So I am going to just very briefly look into this. If you need Im more information on this, um, the owner of our company actually co-authored a manual on cold roof systems in uh, mountainous regions and cold roof systems in warmer regions and several different manuals on how to create the proper cold roof system. So the reason for the cold roof system is help to equalize those temperatures. So the photo on the left is showing you a traditional roof system where you have that above freezing temperature coming from the ridge up at the top. And then as you get out towards the eave, you're getting that melting to happen and then the refreezing that happens directly on the edge of the eave. Where the photo on the right shows you that while utilizing that equal amounts of large amounts of volume air moving through underneath the roofing material itself allows for that attic to also be the outside ambient temperature. So if you're equalizing those temperatures, then you have no difference in temperature on your roofing material and can help with those freezing issues that can come across. So these just show two different situations. These are in Sun Peaks, Canada. These roofs are 100 yards apart. The photo on the left obviously had a large amount of issues with ice damming. And so when they built this project on the right, this is a fully vented cold roof um, roof with a snow retention system installed and it has worked very, very well for them. So there's obviously a lot of plus sides to being able to work with snow retention systems and design with those specifically. That does end the AIA portion of my course. And I'm sorry that I flew through some of that and over talked during some other parts. Um, I can either go straight into questions or I can jump to my portion of that, whatever is easier for you both. Okay, great. Um, honestly, up to you. I know there are a few questions. I can't hear you. also have a record of those after the event. So um, yeah, up to you if you want to answer things now or if you want to follow up afterwards. I'm sorry, I did not hear you on that. Oh, okay, all good. Um, yeah, I was just saying it's totally up to you. We do have quite a few questions, um, but I don't think we'll get to them all. So um, if you would prefer to just follow up with the folks after today's event, we can do that. If you want to get to some now, we can, or you can go ahead and just present the, the rest of what you wanted to talk about today. 
Yeah, I'll jump into presenting and then whatever we have time for for questions, we'll hop there and I will happily reach out to anyone else on any other questions that we don't have time for. Okay. So TRA Snow and Sun, um, we've been in business. This is our 30th year. Terry Anderson, who found the company, actually was a consultant in the roofing industry for many, many years and had done lots of projects with concrete tile and then found out that he had a lot of issues that him and colleagues were running into when it came to snowy regions. So with that, we offer free engineering. Um, we found out a lot of our information through Europe and travels to different regions to see how they handle snow. And with that, we came up with snow brackets and we were able to patent that and had the first snow brackets in the United States. So that's pretty cool. But we do offer the free engineering and layout. So if you reach out to us, you can send us a roof plan. We can send that back to you very quickly on how many brackets, where they need to be placed. As long as it's installed per that layout, it is then warranted for life. That system is from us. So that's a great thing. We do offer guide specifications for all project, uh, all products and then data sheets for all products as well. That's just a little glimpse at the warranty. And then we're also working with the ASTM task group to help develop standards. So this isn't such a large concerning issue for municipalities, for architects, for all of these different people. And so that there's able to be something for everyone to reference and for us and our competitors to make sure that we're all on the same page offering safe and reliable solutions. Terry Anderson still does do um, some consulting on the side. He is mostly retired from the company, but he deal, does still deal very heavily in cold roof systems and serious roof problems such as ice damming. So if there's any questions there, you can reach out to me and I can forward his information on as needed. This will provide you with my contact information, or you can get that through ACE Lab. If you have layouts directly, I would recommend sending those to our inside sales team. They're the best way to handle that. I am always running around like a chicken with my head cut off, so it is much better to get straight to the person who will be able to help you faster with that. But for other questions, I'm more than happy to jump into those. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mindy. Um, and that actually did answer one of the questions we had around uh, engineering support services. So that's Perfect. great. Um, but yeah, I think it looks like we only have a minute left. I know there are quite a few questions in here, so um, we'll have a record of those. Everyone uh, can get their questions answered after today's event. Um, but there's also just a bunch of comments in here that uh, people are saying really great presentation. So thank you so much, Mindy. This Perfect. was super awesome, really informative um, and a very important topic. Um, so thank you so much for today's course. And thank you to everyone who came out for participating today. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one.